Section 112 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. A Farther Insight into the King's Bench. At half past seven o'clock on the following morning, the slipshod waiter knocked at mr curtis's door exclaiming please sir you must get up and go down to the lobby by eight cos you're wanted who wants me there demanded frank leaping from his bed and suddenly animated by the hope that sir christopher had accidentally heard of his predicament and had come to pay his debts but the boy had hurried downstairs again and curtis was accordingly compelled to hurry over his toilette in a state of profound suspense by the time his ablutions were performed and he was dressed it was close upon eight o'clock and he repaired to the gate having bestowed en passant a thundering knock with his clenched fist on the door of the captain's crib the gate of the lower lobby was not yet opened but in its immediate vicinity several of the prisoners were collected some in dressing-gowns others in shirt-sleeves and all having a certain air of seediness not observable elsewhere at length when the massive portal did expand in rushed a motley assortment of messengers charwomen and such itinerant vendors as milkmen watercress boys and the fustian clad individual who sold red herrings and shrimps when this influx of varied specimens of animated nature had passed frank curtis entered the lobby and demanded of a one-armed turnkey standing before the fire who is it that required his presence me and my partner sir was the reply and what for inquired frank just to take your likeness sir was the farther explanation given my likeness cried the young gentleman glancing rapidly around in the expectation of beholding an artist with palette and brushes already but not perceiving any such individual he began to look very ferocious indeed under the impression that the turnkey had a mind to banter him we call it taking the likeness of a new prisoner sir observed the one-armed functionary who was really a very civil fellow when we have him here by daylight just to take a look at him so that we may know him again he added significantly you see sir there's between three and four hundred prisoners in the college we call it a college sir sometimes and it isn't a very easy thing to remember every newcomer unless we have a good look at him oh now i understand you exclaimed frank laughing heartily at the idea of having his likeness taken in such a style while he was yet indulging in this expression of his mirth the other turnkeys made their appearance and each individually wishing him a good morning they scanned him from head to foot apparently committing to memory every one of his features seriatim frank tried to look as unconcerned as possible but he nevertheless felt very uncomfortable and was heartily glad when the operation which lasted about five minutes was over the other turnkeys then withdrew and curtis remained alone with the one-armed official nice place this sir for a prison ain't it asked the latter taking his seat on a stool near the door which stood open and whence the eye commanded a view of the spacious racket ground and a small portion of the main building well it might be a great deal worse replied frank you must have some strange characters here he added inquiringly i believe ye exclaimed the turnkey fixing his looks mysteriously upon the young gentleman in a species of dim intimation that it was indeed a very remarkable place you see that old feller in the rugged blue coat a rolling the fust racket ground there well he come here to this prison twenty year ago in his carriage and had his livery servants to wait upon him and now he's glad to drag that roller every morning for a few pence and can't he manage to get out asked frank with an ominous shudder lord bless you sir cried the turnkey he's his own prisoner his own prisoner repeated curtis what do you mean to say that he keeps himself in the bench i do sir and a many does the same continued the turnkey in a low mysterious tone these poor creatures sir stay in prison so long that all their relations and friends dies off 
and if they went out they wouldn't have a soul to speak to or place to go to so if their creditors dies too and their discharges sent em they keep it in their pockets and never lodge it at the gate cause they prefer staying inside where they have companions and can get a bit of something to eat in one way or another this is the most extraordinary thing i ever heard in my life said frank there's many things more stranger still here returned his informant who was pleased with the mysterious importance which his position as narrator of these marvels gave him what should you think of men putting themselves into prison and making up their minds to stay here all their lives perhaps i should think you were joking if you said so answered curtis joking lord bless you sir i wouldn't joke about no such thing exclaimed the turnkey with a spice of indignation in his manner but i'll tell you how it is there you see that stout man in the shooting jacket a bargaining for them bloaters with the chap that's sitting on the bench outside the tap well he committed a forgery or summer to that kind and knowing there was a warrant against him and not choosing to run away from london for fear of being took in the country he got a friend to arrest him for debt so he immediately passed over to the bench by habeas and the warrant for felony was lodged at the gate against him but his debts must be paid before the warrant can be executed and as you see he's in a manner his own detaining creditor leastways his friend outside is he isn't likely to have his discharge till the felony business can be settled somehow or other the bench is then a most convenient place for people who ought to be in newgate said curtis but live and learn and the more one sees of the world the more curiouser it is ain't it cried the turnkey well now you see that tall stout gentleman there walking up and down in front of the state house with the stick in his hand he's been here some years and is very likely to stay a many years longer his creditors allows him three guineas a week for his kindness in remaining a prisoner in the bench what ejaculated curtis now more astonished than ever his creditors pay him for staying here it's as true as you're alive sir was the reply and it's easy enough to explain too that gentleman has got a good landed estate which is in the hands of his two or three principal creditors who manage it and receive all the rents for the purpose of paying themselves their claims upon him well now if he went through the insolvents court all the creditors would come in for their share of the proceeds of the estate and so the two or three principals ones allows him three guineas a week to keep him here and prevent him going through the court it's a deuced good thing for him i can tell you and he's as happy as a king he has a wife leastways his lady with him we call em all wives here and he's got a batch of the loveliest and nicest children you ever see there they are sir the little innocents a playing there in the mud just as if there wasn't no such place as prison at all and yet they was all born up in that room there in the state house with the green safe at the window and the flower pots and who is that lame elderly man running about with newspapers in his hand inquired frank he's the newsman of the bench and a prisoner like the rest of em was the answer ah some years ago he was a rich man and in a flourishing way of business but he got into chancery and that's the same as getting into the bench cause one always leads to t'other for even to be a vinner in chancery one must pass at least a dozen years or so here fast that seems to be the rule as far as i can understand it well sir now that lame man is obliged to turn newsman so you see there's a many reverses in this world sir ah the world's a queer place ain't it almost as queer as the bench itself what the turnkey's notion of the world might be it is not easy to conceive but they were evidently somewhat dim and misty inasmuch as he seemed impressed with the belief that the bench and the world were two distinct places but then the bench was his world though not a prisoner there himself and perhaps he established a distinction as existing between the world within and the world without alas many many who were prisoners did the same who are those two ladies that have just come down to walk on the gravel there by the side of the racket ground inquired frank curtis much amused by the turnkey's gossip we call that gravel walk the parade observed the official those ladies are mother and daughter and it's the daughter that's the prisoner 
she's a devilish fine gal and the old woman stays with her to take care of her but she and the honourable mr pettifer are deuce thick together and the mother winks at it such things will happen in the best regulated families particularly in the bench when no one ain't over and above particular this ain't the shop for morals mr curtis all the young single women that comes here is sure to get corrupted but that's no look out of mine and with this solacing conclusion the turnkey hit the lock of the door a tremendous blow with his key be the powers and is it after stellin a march upon me that ye are vociferated a well-known voice at this moment and the captain stalked up to the gate looking quite fresh and blooming after a good night's rest and copious ablutions they had me down to take my likeness cried frank or else i dare say i should have slept on till now well we'll just make the round of the bench my boy exclaimed the captain and by that time the breakfast will be ready i've ordered it hot rolls and coffee with kidneys eggs cresses and such like trifles and a walk will give us an appetite curtis accordingly took his friend's arm and they set out on their limited ramble that building on your right frank said the captain is the state house where government prisoners and such like spalpeens are kept or ought to be kept but the prisoners for debt get hold of the rooms there and the devil himself can't turn em out but here's the tap and this is the first line of the binch they entered a low and dirty-looking place in which there were several common tables of the roughest description and the surfaces of which were completely carved out into names initial letters men hanging and a variety of devices these ingenious and very elaborate specimens of wood engraving having been effected by penknives a tremendous fire burnt in the grate round which were assembled several of the poorer classes of prisoners and the messengers eating their breakfast and at one of the tables just alluded to the newsman was sorting his papers as the captain and curtis were retracing their way from an inspection of the interior of the tap-room the former stopped at the bar exclaiming to the man in attendance two half pints mr vernon and good morning to you you would not drink malt liquor so early will you asked frank with a look of astonishment at his companion be jesus and it's for you to taste the port of me boy exclaimed the captain don't you remember all i said yesterday in its praise come drink and mr curtis was accordingly compelled to swallow half a pint of porter though malt liquor before breakfast was somewhat repugnant to his taste the beer was veritably of first-rate quality and the captain was as proud to hear the young gentleman's eulogy on its merits as if he had brewed it himself now let us continue our ramble said he and away they went arm in arm the two or three poor prisoners who were lounging at the door of the tap respectfully making room for them to pass entering upon the parade frank now for the first time obtained a full view of the front of the main building a long gloomy barrack-like structure with half a dozen entrance-ways leading to the various staircases fixed to the ledges of many of the windows were safes in which the prisoners kept their provisions and in several instances these safes were covered with flower-pots containing sickly plants precisely in the centre of the building was the chapel and over the chapel was the infirmary some of the rooms on the ground floor were fitted up as little shops the occupants being prisoners and the business carried on being entirely in the general line the lumps of butter wedges of cheese red herrings slices of bacon matches balls of twine candles racket balls sweetstuff loaves of bread rolls soap eggs and other articles of the nature usually sold in such magnificent marts of commerce were arranged so as to make the best possible show and carry out the spirit of competition which raged as fiercely in that little community as in the world without a peep through the window of one of those miniature shops showed the canisters of tea and the jars of tobacco and snuff standing orderly upon the shelves of three feet in length and behind a counter along which tom thumb could have walked in two strides stood the stout proprietor of the concern examining with rueful looks the wonderful increase of chalk marks which the morning's sales had compelled him to make upon a slate against the honoured names of his customers now look this way my friend said the captain 
as he forced Frank to turn round towards the racket courts. "'Do you see nothing particular?' "'Nothing but the high wall, with the spikes on the top, and the netting to prevent the balls from going over,' answered Curtis. "'There, there, me boy!' vociferated O'Blunderbuss, impatiently pointing in a particular direction. "'Now do you see anything worth looking at?' "'Well, I see the pump there,' said Frank, vainly searching after a more interesting object. "'Be Jesus, and that's just what I wanted you to see!' exclaimed the captain. "'It's the dolphin pump, me boy, the finest pump in Europe, the pride of the binch. But be the powers, ye shall taste the water and judge for yourself.' Curtis protested that he would rather not. The captain was, however, resolute and a tumbler was borrowed from a prisoner who was smoking an early pipe at one of the ground-floor windows. Then the captain began to pump away like a madman, and Frank was compelled to imbibe a deep draught of the ice-cold water, which would have been pronounced delicious by anyone who did not admire alcoholic beverages much better than Adam's ale. "'Don't you mean to take a glass, captain?' inquired Frank. "'Be Jesus, and I know it of old returned the gallant gentleman so there's no need for me to pass an opinion upon it besides it's not to astonish my stomach with any unusual drink that i be after frank but you're a young man and can stand water better than me curtis did not consider the reasoning altogether conclusive he however refrained from farther argument and the two gentlemen resumed their walk between the eastern extremity of the main building and that part of the wall which looked directly upon the borough was the market-place, an assemblage of miserable sheds where a butcher, a fishmonger, a greengrocer, and a vendor of coals carried on each his peculiar traffic, the said spirited traders being prisoners as well as the shopkeepers above alluded to. At a stall in the centre of the market, and at which vegetables, fruit, and fish were sold, stood a tall, thin, weather-beaten old woman, resembling a gipsy in dress as well as in complexion, and having an ancient bonnet perched almost airily upon the top of her head. This respectable female was denominated Old Nanny, and was in such wise greeted by Captain O'Blunderbuss, who informed Frank in a whisper that she was not a prisoner, and, in spite of competition, had pretty well the monopoly of the market. "'The fact is, me boy,' he said, "'she has the advantage of money.' those fellows in the shed there set up in business with a floating capital of eighteen pence each and can't afford to give credit and a tradesman in the binch who can't give credit stands no more chance be jesus of getting custom than if he began with an empty shop the captain now proceeded to show his friend the public kitchen which was in the immediate vicinity of the market and thence they passed up the back of the main building O'Blunderbuss especially directing Frank's attention to that quarter which was denominated the poor side. The poor side, yes, in every public establishment in England, is the line of demarcation drawn between the rich and the poor, in the debtor's prison as well as in the church of God. Oh, what a disgraceful thing is poverty made in this country! Why, the contamination of Newgate, if borne by a man possessing a well filled purse, will be overlooked in society, while the rags that an unsullied character wears are a ban, a stigma, a reproach. He has been in the workhouse, or she has been on the parish, are taunts as bitter in meaning and as keen in spirit as the phrase, he has been in Newgate, or she has come from the treadmill. Aye, and even amongst the lowest classes themselves, it is a deeper stain to associate a name with the workhouse than to connect it with the felon's jail. Such is the dreadful, demoralizing consequence of that example set by the upper classes, whose ideas of men's excellence and worth are guided chiefly by the standard of the purse. The poor side! And for whom is the poor side of debtors' prisons instituted? For those who go penniless to jail, the best proof that they have profited nothing by the losses of their creditors the best evidence that their liabilities were legitimately contracted. But the fashionable swindler, your man about town, your roué, your rake, who gets into debt wherever he can, and without the slightest intention of ever paying a single farthing, he drives down in his cab to the prison, treats the bailiff to wine upon the way, and takes with him into confinement all that remains to him of the plunder of duped tradesmen, 
there to spend it in riotous living and in the best room which the best quarter of the jail can afford if a debtor's prison have a poor side it ought also to have a swindler's side no word in the english language is used so frequently and so contemptuously as the monosyllable poor oh he is a poor devil is a far worse character to give any one than to say at once he is dishonest from the latter sentence there is a hopeful appeal in the question but can he pay yes he can if he chooses oh then if he can we will trust him and risk it but from the former sentence there is no appeal it is a judgment without qualification a decision too positive and weighty to admit of a doubt the objection well he may be poor but he may also be honest is never heard the idea of poverty being honest why in the estimation of an englishman poverty is a word expressing all that is bad to say that a man is poor is at once to sum up his character as everything unprincipled and roguish such magic is there in the word that rich men and men well to do in the world instantly button up their breeches pockets when they hear it applied to a person they seem to consider that a poor wretch can have no other possible object in view than to get the better of them poverty in their eyes is something that goes about preying upon the rich something to be loathed and shunned something that ought not to intrude itself into respectable places a man may just as well be leprous as be poor so undeniable are these truths so universally recognized are these facts that designing individuals always endeavor to seem well off even if they are insolvent they dress well because they know the sovereign influence of a good coat they talk largely because they see how necessary it is to keep up appearances they toss about their last few guineas as the only means of baiting a hook to catch fresh dupes it is impossible that a man with fine clothes well-polished boots elegant guard chain and lemon-coloured gloves it is impossible that such a man can be poor oh no trust him with anything why what poor man would be perfumed as he is the aristocratic odour of wealth surrounds him as with an atmosphere peculiar to the rich trust him by all means but that poor-looking devil who sneaks along the shady side of the way who has a wife and a half a dozen children at home and who is struggling from morning to night to earn an honourable crust don't trust him have nothing to do with him don't assist him with the loan of a single sixpence on the contrary give him a thrust farther down into the mud if you can because he is undisguisedly poor such appear to be the rules of conduct in this enlightened and glorious country god help the poor for poverty is a terrible crime in merry england the poor side of the king's bench struck frank curtis as being particularly miserable it gave him quite the horrors and no wonder for the architect a knowing fellow was he had so arranged the building that the windows of the poor side should look upon the dustbins and the conveniences yes a knowing fellow was that architect he understood what the poor are worth in this free and civilized land he saw in a moment where they ought to be put and therefore he arranged for their use a number of dens where the atmosphere was certain to be one incessant pestilential odor and where he would have been sorry very sorry to have placed the kennel of his favorite hound yes well might frank curtis feel the horrors callous and indifferent as the young man naturally was on beholding the poor side the ground floor rooms were even at midday in a state of twilight the colossal wall being only a few feet distant the windows were blackened with dirt and from the upper ones hung a few rags the miserable duds of the miserable miserable inmates half starved pale and emaciated women the wives or daughters of those poor prisoners were loitering in the doorways some with children in their arms children oh so wan and wasted so sickly and so death-like that it must have made their parents heart bleed to feel how light they were and how famine-struck they seemed and yet those little starving children had their innocent winning ways as well as the offspring of, of the rich 
and they threw their skeleton arms around their mother's necks, and their lips sent forth those infantile sounds so sweet to mother's ears. But still the little being seemed to be pining rapidly away through actual want and in the prison atmosphere. God help the poor, we said ere now, but oh, with tearful eyes and beating heart, do we exclaim, God help the children of the poor. Frank Curtis and the captain, having now completed their walk round the prison, entered the parlour of the coffee-house, where an excellent breakfast awaited them, and to which they did ample justice. The repast being disposed of, Captain O'Blunderbuss took a temporary leave of Frank Curtis, it being arranged that the gallant officer should proceed to Baker Street, in order to induce the men in possession, either by means of bribes or menaces, to allow Mrs. Curtis to remove as many valuables from the house as possible, and this notable aim being achieved, the captain was to pay his respect to Sir Christopher Blunt. Frank Curtis, being now temporarily thrown upon his own resources for amusement, strolled out upon the parade and was gazing at the racket players when Mr. Prout accosted him. "'Good morning, sir. Have you taken a survey of the bench yet?' said the Chancery prisoner. "'I have been rounding the building, and seen all that worth seeing, I believe,' replied Curtis. "'But the poor side appears to be a wretched place.' "'Wretched?' cried Prout, in a bitter tone. "'Ah, you may well make that observation, sir. "'But if my affairs do not end in a speedy settlement, "'I shall have to move to that quarter myself.' "'How is that?' inquired Frank. "'Do you not know? "'Have you not yet learned that you must pay even to have a room in this prison?' "'A place to which you do not come of your own accord?' said Prout. "'A shilling a week is the room-rent, and he who cannot pay it must go over to the poor side. "'This is English justice, Mr. Curtis. You must pay to live in a prison.' "'It seems to me monstrously unfair.' "'Unfair? Tis vile, rascally,' replied the Chancery prisoner but talking of the poor side puts me in a mind of a strange story connected with that quarter of the bench and if you have nothing better to do for an hour or so and will step up to my room i shall have great pleasure interrupted curtis for to tell you the truth the time does hang rather heavy on my hands until my friends the marquis of aldersgate and the prince of paris who is staying in london come over to see me i may just as well amuse myself with your story Prout, accordingly, led the way to his room, which was in the front of the building, and commanded a view of the parade and racket-grounds. It was very plainly furnished, but neat and clean, and its owner informed Curtis that he had a married daughter who visited him every day, was very kind to him, and superintended his little domestic concerns. "'But I will not detain you longer than I can help, sir,' observed Prout and I can promise you that you are about to hear a true tale of deep interest. I have thought of it so often, and have so frequently repeated its details to myself, in the solitude of this chamber, that I am enabled to give you the whole story in a connected form, although it was not in the same continuous manner that the vicissitudes I am about to relate became known to me. Alas, tis a sad, sad tale, sir. But I am afraid that, bad as it is, it still is not the worst that might be told of human nature. Frank Curtis seated himself opposite to the old man, who, after a short pause, commenced his narrative in the following words. End of section 112。Section 113 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter 107 A Tale of Sorrow. Part 1. It was about thirty years ago that a poor but respectable and kind-hearted tradesman of the name of Craddock came up from Plymouth to London to receive a hundred pounds which had fallen to him through the death of a relative of whom he had not heard for years until he received the lawyer's letter announcing his decease 
and the legacy craddock was a linen draper in a very small way at plymouth and though industrious temperate and obliging he never had succeeded in doing anything better than earning a mere living he was about forty-five years of age at the time of which i am speaking and had long been married to a woman as generous-souled as himself they were childless and in spite of their poverty they often regretted that they had no offspring to become the object of their affection and to comfort them when old age should overtake them indeed it appears that they had seriously thought of adopting some poor person's child but circumstances of various kinds had opposed this plan and they at last ceased to converse upon it endeavouring to render themselves as happy as they could in each other's society and happy for that matter they were too for the mutual attachment which linked their hearts together was firmly established and as they advanced in years they seemed to become so necessary to each other that when craddock received the lawyer's letter summoning him to london it was with the greatest difficulty his wife would allow him to set out alone he however succeeded in making her understand that a hundred pounds did not constitute an independent fortune that it was absolutely necessary to carry on the shop and that therefore she must remain at home to manage it accordingly the worthy dame tarried at plymouth and her husband came up to london by the stage at that period a journey of no inconsiderable importance it was the first time mr craddock had ever been in the metropolis but he did not stay a moment longer than his business absolutely compelled him which was four or five days the lawyer with whom he had to transact his little affair was a kind and conscientious man for there are many good lawyers as well as bad ones and he hastened the business as much as possible accordingly mr craddock received his money in less than a week and he instantly went to the bell sauvage on ludgate hill to take his place home again by the coach there was only one inside seat vacant by the stage that was to start in the evening and craddock secured it he then returned to the little lodging where he had slept during his sojourn in london and which was somewhere in the neighbourhood of doctors commons having packed up his portmanteau he shouldered it and was wending his way to the belle sauvage when his attention was drawn to a little boy who was sitting on a doorstep in one of the narrow secluded streets in that district the child who was very neatly dressed and about two years old was crying bitterly craddock stopped and spoke kindly to him and though the boy was too young to give any explanation of the cause of his grief it was easy to divine that he had strayed from home or been lost by a negligent servant two or three other persons stopped likewise and some of the neighbours came out of their houses but the boy was unknown to them craddock tried to console him but the little fellow wept as if his heart would break by accident the parish beadle passed that way and on learning what was the matter said oh the best thing i can do is to take the poor child to the workhouse now the mere name of a workhouse was terrible to the ears of the kind-hearted craddock and obeying the impulse of the moment he exclaimed no no not while i have a crust to give him poor child why don't you take him home with you then demanded the beadle the parish will be very glad to be quit of such a bargain as a lost child promises to be but i live at plymouth returned honest john craddock never mind if you live at the devil so as you agree to take the child persisted the parochial authority well i have not the least objection on the contrary i shall be delighted to do so said craddock his eyes filling with tears as the poor boy's grief became more heart-rending 
i will give you my address and if you hear any inquiries made by the parents of the child you can let me know very good exclaimed the beadle as he received the card on which john craddock's name calling and abode were printed in bold type the worthy linen draper then took up the boy in his arms the beadle consenting to carry the portmanteau and in this manner they proceeded to the belle sauvage the kind looks soothing tone and fond caresses of craddock having the effect of somewhat diminishing the little fellow's grief the coach was just ready to start and craddock took his place with the child upon his knees the beadle renewed his promise to write in case he should hear anything relative to the boy's parents and the stage rolled out of the old inn-yard it was evening the shops glared with light and the scene as well as the ride in the coach amused the boy so that his violent weeping ceased but frequent sobs agitated his little chest until at last he fell asleep in worthy john craddock's arms it was now for the first time that the linen draper had leisure to reflect upon the step which he had taken and it struck him that he had acted imprudently he was taking away the child from the city to which he most probably belonged and where he was alone likely to be found by his parents taking him away to a far distant town but on the other hand he remembered the beadle's declaration that the lost child must be conveyed to the workhouse and he likewise felt certain that should the little creature's parents make proper inquiries concerning their child the parochial authority would know what explanation to give craddock therefore came to the conclusion that he had performed a christian deed and an englishman's duty and having thus set all scruples at rest he began to reflect upon the pleasure which his wife would experience in receiving the foundling for the child was a most interesting one with curly flaxen hair sparkling blue eyes and a sweet complexion and as he lay sleeping in craddock's arms and the lights of the shops in the outskirts of london which the coach was then traversing beamed through the window upon the boy's countenance the worthy linen draper thought that he had never seen a face so truly cherub-like but tears came afresh into the worthy man's eyes for he reflected that an afflicted father and a distracted mother might at that moment be calling upon heaven to restore them their lost child and as he bent down and kissed its cool and firm cheeks on which the traces of weeping still remained he murmured to himself if thy parents never succeed in recovering thee my boy i will be as a father and i know that my wife will be as a mother to thee the other inside passengers admired the child greatly but when honest john craddock told them the story connected with his possession of the boy they merely hemmed and coughed dryly as if they thought him a very great fool for so burthening himself craddock understood what was passing in their minds and he only hugged the child closer to his bosom during the night the little fellow frequently awoke and cried for his papa and mamma and the good linen draper was indefatigable in his exertions to console and comfort him uttering all possible kind things and purchasing nice cakes for him at the wayside inns throughout the following day too craddock was compelled to persevere in this affectionate and conciliatory treatment which he however maintained with a good heart and as the long tedious journey of two hundred and sixteen miles drew towards a close and evening was again drawing on he had the satisfaction of observing that his little charge seemed to appreciate or at least to understand his attentions at last the coach entered the famous seaport and in a very short time craddock was set down at his own door the stage passing through the street in which he lived you may suppose that his wife was greatly astonished when she perceived the present that the worthy linen-draper had brought her 
but she was not many moments before she took the child in her arms and covered it with kisses then how the kind-hearted dame wept when craddock explained to her the manner in which he had become possessed of the boy and as he spoke she pressed the little being all the closer and all the more fondly to her bosom the social tea-table was spread and the servant-girl was sent out to procure some cakes and other nice things for the boy and then how he was petted and made much of and how happy the good couple seemed when their attentions and caresses were rewarded with smiles several days passed during which craddock received no intelligence from the beadle who had promised to write him in case of enquiries being instituted respecting the lost child weeks elapsed and still no tidings the idea i had almost said the fear which the worthy couple entertained that they might be compelled to part with the child just as they were getting fond of it grew gradually fainter and fainter and at length when six months had passed and little alexander for so they called the boy had grown not only reconciled to his condition but appeared to have forgotten that it had ever been otherwise by the time six months had passed i say mr and mrs craddock ceased to contemplate even the chance of being called upon to surrender their charge not but that those excellent people would have rejoiced in one sense to restore little alexander to the arms of his parents but in another sense they could not quench in their secret souls the fond hope that he might be left undisturbedly in their care thus time passed on craddock's business which had only required a little capital to give it an impetus exhibited every sign of improvement since the investment therein of the hundred pounds received in london and alexander throve apace i shall now take a leap of twenty years which brings us up to a date of only ten years ago and at that time great alterations but all for the better had taken place in the circumstances of the craddocks indeed they had retired from business having made a considerable fortune and were settled in a handsome dwelling at a short distance from plymouth their native town craddock and his wife had however descended tolerably far into the vale of life sixty-five winters having passed over their heads but in alexander now a fine tall handsome young man of twenty-two they had a source of real comfort and happiness though acquainted with the circumstance which had led to his adoption by mr and mrs craddock and therefore knowing well that they were not his real parents his attachment to them was so great his affection so sincere and his gratitude so boundless that he never once manifested any desire to quit them for the purpose of instituting inquiries relative to his birth his constant and unwearied endeavour was to show himself deserving of all they had done for him the tender care they had taken of him in his infancy the excellent education they had given him in his boyhood and the affectionate consideration with which they treated him now that he was grown to man's estate for in all respects did they regard him as their son and in this light was he looked upon by their friends and dependents in fact nothing was wanting to complete the happiness of alexander craddock he had become enamoured of a beautiful girl the orphan daughter of an officer in the navy and who resided at plymouth with an old aunt lucy middleton had no fortune but she possessed the invaluable treasures of amiability of disposition a sweet temper a kind heart and those sterling qualities which fitted her for domesticity and gave promise that she would prove an admirable housewife alexander loved her and was loved in return and his adopted parents gave their consent to the match accordingly one fine spring morning when the heavens appeared as auspicious as the prospects of the youthful pair the hands of alexander craddock and lucy middleton were united 
and after a six weeks tour in wales they returned to plymouth to take possession of a commodious and handsome dwelling which the adopted father of the young man had furnished during their absence for their reception a year passed away at the expiration of which lucy presented her husband with a lovely boy but almost at the same time the family experienced a severe loss in the death of old mr craddock who was carried off in a moment by the lightning stroke of apoplexy alexander was dreadfully grieved at this shocking occurrence a feeling in which his excellent young wife largely shared but they were compelled to restrain their sorrow as much as possible in order to console the bereaved widow mrs craddock was however unable to bear up against this heavy affliction the suddenness of its arrival and the awful manner in which her husband fell down dead at her feet when as it were in the midst of a state of perfect health gave her a shock which she never recovered she was spirit broken and could not rally in spite of the tender devotion and unwearied attentions shown her by alexander and lucy as well as by the aunt of the latter thus it was that in less than six weeks from the sudden demise of mr craddock his affectionate relict was consigned to the same tomb which held his remains when alexander had so far recovered himself after experiencing these cruel inroads upon his happiness as to investigate the affairs of his late adopted parents he found that he was left sole heir to the handsome fortune acquired by their honest industry but though the will and other papers were strictly correct and accurate in all points he found that certain circumstances connected with his inheritance would compel him to repair to london and probably retain him in the capital for some weeks he was not sorry at the idea of quitting plymouth for a time his spirits having been deeply affected by the deaths of his adopted parents and he found lucy and her aunt who now lived altogether with them perfectly agreeable to shift their place of abode it was accordingly about eight years ago that this family arrived in london and took a house in a genteel but quiet neighbourhood alexander found his income chiefly derived from funded property to be seven hundred a year and on this he knew that he could live well but not extravagantly a natural curiosity which was the more lively now that he had lost his adopted parents prompted him to make certain enquiries in the district of doctors commons with the hope of solving the mystery of his birth the only intelligence he gleaned was that the beadle who figured in the opening of the tale had been dead just twenty-two years and as alexander was now twenty-four he could calculate pretty accurately that the parochial authority alluded to must have been carried off by the hand of the destroyer within a few weeks if not within even a very few days from the date when he himself as a young child had fallen into the charge of craddock beyond this fact alexander could ascertain nothing at all calculated to assist in rolling away the veil of mystery which covered his parentage none of the inhabitants in the street where craddock had found him sitting on the doorstep remembered anything of the loss of a child at the period named no tradition of the fact remained alexander felt somewhat disappointed with these unsuccessful results of his enquiries but he possessed too many elements of happiness too many substantial accessories to comfort and mental tranquillity to remain long affected or dispirited by the apparent permanence of that mystery which enveloped his birth alexander was naturally of an active disposition and abhorred a life of idleness he had been married two years and was the father of two children and contemplating the probability of having a numerous offspring he felt anxious to augment his worldly possessions my adopted father he would reason with himself carried on business until a late period of his life and was happy in the occupation which it afforded him 
why should not i embark in some eligible and safe undertaking which will give me a few hours employment every day and yield a profit at the same time the subject of his musings was communicated to his amiable wife and her aunt and those ladies joyfully encouraged a spirit so praiseworthy and so indicative of steadiness and prudence the matter had been under discussion one morning at the breakfast-table when the daily newspaper was brought in and an announcement worded somewhat in this way met alexander's eyes eligible investment any gentleman having a few thousand pounds at his immediate disposal and desirous to occupy a few leisure hours each day in a highly respectable and advantageous manner is requested to apply to edward walkden solicitor bush lane cannon street alexander read this advertisement aloud and the ladies agreed with him that the nature of it was tempting enough to prompt farther inquiry accordingly the young man proceeded in the course of the morning to the address indicated and found mr walkden's establishment to be large and having every appearance of respectability as well as solidity half a dozen clerks were busily employed in the front office and the shelves were covered with japanned tin cases containing the papers of the most substantial clients upon being introduced into the lawyer's private office alexander found himself in the presence of a tall man whose years were upwards of sixty and whose countenance once handsome wore an expression of mingled mournfulness and severity he was attired in a plain suit of black his manners were cold and reserved but there was a business-like air about him and his office which augmented the good opinion already entertained by alexander in respect to the lawyer and his establishment walkden was evidently a man of very few words and therefore when alexander had explained the object of his visit the information he sought was speedily given i have a client said the lawyer who has taken out a patent for a particular purpose and he requires five or six thousand pounds to work it effectually the person advancing the amount will become an equal partner with the patentee and will find a few hours of pleasant and agreeable occupation daily in superintending the commercial branch of the concern while the patentee directs the manufacture of the article there are the papers sir take them with you and read them at your leisure walkden handed the young man a bundle of documents tied round with red tape and then bowed him out of the office on his return home alexander examined the papers and was highly delighted with the prospect which they opened to him he felt convinced that an immense fortune was to be made the thing was as clear as daylight the patentee possessed the secret of effecting vast improvements in the manufacture of broadcloths which he undertook to produce not only of a superior quality but likewise at a very reduced price the calculation showed that large returns were certain to follow a comparatively small outlay and that the business might be extended to a wonderful degree in proportion to the capital advanced to work upon in a word the whole affair was of the most roseate hue alexander his wife and her aunt were in raptures at the brilliant prospect thus fortunately open to their contemplation and it was resolved that he should lose no time in securing a share of so excellent an undertaking accordingly on the following morning he returned to mr walkden who received him with cold politeness and requested his speedy decision in the matter as so promising a business had already attracted the notice of several capitalists who were eager and willing to embark their funds and you will guarantee the respectability of your client sir inquired alexander i have been established in this profession for upwards of thirty years young man said the lawyer almost sternly and never have i allowed my office to be made the means of carrying out an illegitimate transaction my client mr scudamore 
is a man of integrity and honour and whatever he promises that will he perform in this case mr walkden observed alexander craddock the sooner i have an interview with mr scudamore the better the lawyer made no farther observation but furnished his visitor with the address of the patentee and alexander accordingly repaired to mr scudamore's dwelling which was situated somewhere near finsbury square mr scudamore was an elderly person very well dressed plausible in his discourse and over polite in his manners in fact he seemed to be the very reverse of his solicitor in respect to disposition for he received alexander as if he had known him all his life and the young man found himself sitting at lunch and on the best possible terms with his new friend almost before he had time to look round him then if the affair which thus brought them together had looked well upon paper it assumed so glorious an aspect when described in the glowing language of mr scudamore that alexander craddock generous frank and confiding as he naturally was came to a complete understanding with the patentee ere he took his departure on the following day scudamore dined at his house and the ladies were quite charmed with their new acquaintance matters progressed rapidly through the business-like attention which walkden devoted to the affair and in less than a fortnight the deeds of partnership between alexander craddock and james scudamore were duly signed at the lawyer's office in bush lane cannon street immediately afterwards alexander sold out six thousand pounds which he paid into a bank to the joint account of craddock and scudamore and in the course of a few days the latter gentleman took his departure for a manufacturing town where he was to hire premises and establish a factory without delay alexander remaining in london to prepare a warehouse to receive the goods for some months all appeared to go on to the complete satisfaction of both parties scudamore wrote up the most pleasing accounts from the country and at last he informed his young partner that the factory was in perfect readiness to commence operations it however appeared that more money was required and alexander after an interview with walkden threw a farther sum of four thousand pounds into the business all the funds being completely at the disposal of scudamore but almost immediately after the advance of this second sum the letters from the provincial town ceased several weeks passed away no communications were received from scudamore and mr walkden appeared to be as astonished as alexander himself a visit to the banker created a vague suspicion in the mind of the young man that all was not right for though scudamore had drawn out the first amount by means of a number of successive checks he had received the whole of the second advance on one draft and almost immediately after it had been paid in a little farther inquiry convinced alexander that walkden had presented all the checks for payment at the bank without however losing a moment by calling on the lawyer for an explanation alexander proceeded post haste to the provincial town where he expected to find scudamore and there all his fears were speedily confirmed no premises had been hired by any such person no factory established in such a name but mr scudamore had resided at a hotel in the place for several months and had taken his departure no one knew whither on a date which on calculation alexander found to be precisely four days after he had paid the second sum into the banker's hands no doubt now remained in his mind that he was the dupe of a designing villain and he was convinced that walkden was an accomplice to london he returned without delay and on his arrival he repaired direct to the lawyer's office that professional gentleman received him with his usual cold and reserved politeness affecting not even to notice the excitement under which the young man was laboring End of section 113 
section 114 of the mysteries of london volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the mysteries of london volume 3 by george w m reynolds chapter 107 a tale of sorrow part two your friend mr scudamore sir is a villain exclaimed alexander such language is intolerable in my office sir said walkden in his chilling phlegmatic manner intolerable or not it is the only language i can use under such circumstances cried the young man scudamore has absconded with the whole sum of ten thousand pounds which i advanced in this swindling concern and it was through you and your representation sir that i have been thus cruelly deceived and basely plundered softly mr craddock if you please observed the lawyer because your language conveys an imputation which i repel with scorn and contempt my character is too well established to be injured by the calumny of an obscure stranger you requested me to give you mr scudamore's address in the first instance i did so and it was with him that you made all your arrangements you then both came to me informed me that everything was settled between you and employed me professionally to draw up certain deeds but you gave me the highest character of your friend scudamore ejaculated alexander i spoke of him as i had always found him up to that hour when you questioned me said walkden but i never pretended to possess the power of prophesying that he would continue honest up to the day of his death contemptible vile sophistry exclaimed alexander his cheeks glowing with indignation it is a base conspiracy to plunder me and i will unmask you and supposing that i have incurred a chance of losing as much as yourself through this scudamore said the lawyer without losing his temper but with a smile of malignant triumph on his lips you lose by him cried alexander in a tone of bitter irony you knew him too well to trust him at all events i may have somewhat calculated upon your joint responsibility observed walkden fixing his cold grey eyes upon the young man whom these ominous words startled what do you mean he demanded his heart sinking within him i mean answered walkden that i have discounted your acceptances to the amount of eight thousand pounds that i have passed away those bills of exchange in the course of business that when they fall due shortly i shall be unable to take them up and that the holder will therefore look to you for the payment of them alexander sank speechless and powerless into a seat as the whole scheme of villainy was thus fully developed to his horrified contemplation as you were in partnership and all the deeds establishing that partnership were drawn up in the regular way and strictly binding scudamore had not only a right to sign bills in your joint name proceeded the lawyer but you cannot for an instant dispute your liability in respect to them is it possible gasped alexander that i can have been so foolish and you so wicked oh my poor wife my beloved children what will become of you now that i am ruined by my own madness and this awful combination of villainies mr craddock said walkden drawing himself up to his full height while his iron features remained implacable and rigid you must not allow your tongue a license in respect to me again i tell you that my character is too well established and my reputation too substantially good to be injured by false calumnies indeed i am not at all clear that i have not some grounds to complain of conspiracy and villainy for it certainly looks suspicious most suspicious that your partner should obtain from me advances to the amount of eight thousand pounds and then abscond 
you would not come out of court with very clean hands mr craddock i can tell you wretch ejaculated the unhappy young man now goaded to desperation how dare you hint at any connivance on my part with the scoundrelism of your own friend you who presented at the bank all the drafts for the money which i was insane enough to lodge there i certainly received several sums on behalf of mr scudamore to whom i duly remitted them said the lawyer still in that cold reserved tone which so much aggravated the rage of the ruined craddock but we will now put an end to this interview sir he added as my time is precious yes i will leave you treacherous miscreant that you are exclaimed alexander and rushing into the clerk's office he vociferated with mad excitement gentlemen if you wish to behold the greatest villain on the face of the earth go and look at your master he then hurried away the victim of a mingled rage and grief which it would be impossible to describe but how could he face his dear wife her affectionate aunt his much-loved children ruined totally ruined how awfully do these words sound upon the ears a man when alone in the world and with none dependent on him or his exertions may murmur those words to himself with comparative calmness but the individual who has a wife and children looking to him for every necessary of existence ah he indeed feels his heart seared as with red-hot iron when his lips expressing the conviction which circumstances force on his startled mind frame the frightful words ruined totally ruined miss middleton the aunt and lucy were already acquainted with the unpleasant nature of the suspicions which scudamore's protracted silence had created in the mind of alexander and they were likewise aware of the object of his journey into the country but they had yet to learn the fatal result of the inquiries which he had instituted and it was still left for him to break to them the particulars of his interview with walkden on his return home his anxiety and mental suffering were betrayed by his countenance for he was unskilled in the schools of duplicity and knew not how to conceal a lacerated heart beneath a tranquil exterior the ladies pressed him with questions they saw that something dreadful had occurred and they implored him not to keep them in suspense he told them all told them how scudamore had plundered him of ten thousand pounds how he remained liable to walkden for eight thousand more and how the payment of this imminent liability would sweep away the whole of his fortune leaving him a ruined man then in that hour of bitter trial he found how dear is woman as a ministering angel and having been comparatively soothed and tranquillized by the consolatory language of his lucy and miss middleton he proceeded to the office of his own solicitor whom he resolved to consult relative to the posture of his affairs the moment he had left the house lucy and miss middleton held a hasty council together do you think it would be imprudent or improper my dear aunt asked the young wife if i were to call upon this mr walkden and implore him not to press the payment of a debt which will deprive alexander of all the resources that he might render available for the purpose of retrieving himself on the contrary i approve of the step was the reply alexander says that mr walkden was stern and severe but then alexander himself may have been hasty and indignant after all this mr walkden has perhaps been duped as well as your husband by scudamore i fear that this is not the case said lucy i am impressed with the conviction that the lawyer and scudamore were in league together 
nevertheless as we are entirely at walton's mercy it would be unwise to irritate but prudent to conciliate him go my dear child exclaimed the aunt and may you succeed in softening the heart of this man who holds your dear husband in his iron grasp lucy accordingly attired herself in a simple and modest manner and proceeded to the office of mr walkden who happening to be disengaged at the time immediately received her i have called sir began lucy whose courage almost failed her when she found herself in the presence of a man of such stern cold and indeed forbidding aspect for this was the first time she had ever seen him i have called sir she repeated on behalf of my husband whose ruin is certain unless you show him some degree of mercy mr craddock behaved in a manner the most insulting and dared to utter suspicions the most derogatory to my character even in the presence of my clerks observed walton in a tone so chilling that it seemed as if the breath which wafted those words to the young wife's ears passed over the ice of the poles but surely sir urged lucy the tears trickling down her cheeks you will make some allowances for the excited feelings of a young man just entering the world as it were and so cruelly struck on its very threshold by the hand of misfortune at least sir if not for his sake i implore you for that of his innocent children to be lenient and merciful law forms and ceremonies are not influenced by such considerations madam said mr walkden at the same time i have no objection to search the commentaries and if i there find leniency recommended in filing a declaration or mercy enjoined in signing judgment i have not the slightest objection to instruct my common law clerk accordingly lucy stared at the attorney in wild bewilderment and uncertainty as he thus delivered himself in a measured tone of such frigidity that it seemed as if an automaton of ice were speaking but at length she murmured may i then hope sir that you will not press for the payment of this heavy debt when the bills become due walkden fixed his eyes upon the lovely and tearful countenance which was upturned so imploringly towards him and at the instant he thought within himself that he had never before seen a female face of such surpassing beauty then his glance slowly and deliberately wandered from the faultless features to the contours of the well-formed bust developed even by the plaits of the thick shawl which lucy wore and thence his survey was continued until his contemplation had embraced the wasp-like waist and the flowing outlines of a symmetrical form terminating in feet and ankles ravishingly modelled you are doubtless much attached to your husband madam he said his tone becoming the least thing more tender or rather losing one small degree of its cold severity attached to him sir exclaimed lucy perfectly astonished at the question i love i worship him he is the best of husbands and the best of fathers then you would make any sacrifice to restore him to peace of mind said walkden his voice becoming more tender still and his demeanour gradually unbending from its stiff formality oh yes cried the artless lucy any sacrifice would i make to see my alexander happy as he was wont to be any sacrifice repeated the lawyer now positively allowing his features to relax into a faint and significant smile while his voice was lowered and changed into a tone of soft familiarity consider what you say any sacrifice well then on that condition and he took her hand a light broke instantaneously upon the mind of lucy and snatching back her hand as if from the maw of a wild beast she started from her seat uttered a cry of indignation and abhorrence and disappeared from the office 
before the baffled and disconcerted lawyer had time to make an effort to detain her lucy's heart was still swelling with mingled resentment and anguish when she reached her home and alexander who returned at the same time saw in an instant that she was a prey to no ordinary emotions throwing herself into her husband's arms lucy burst into tears her pent-up feelings no longer obeying the control of that restraint which she sought to impose upon them then by dint of questioning alexander gleaned enough to convince him that his beloved wife had been flagrantly insulted by the villain who had already heaped such grievous wrongs upon his head maddened by this fresh injury alexander was about to rush from the house and inflict some dreadful chastisement upon the cold-blooded monster walkden when his wife and her aunt threw themselves at his feet and implored him with tears and impassioned entreaties not to aggravate the perils and embarrassments of his position by involving himself in a quarrel with their enemy alexander was moved by the prayers of those whom he loved and he faithfully promised them not to suffer his indignant feelings to master his prudence when calmness and composure were somewhat restored he proceeded to explain the result of the visit which he had just paid to his own solicitor that gentleman had said to him it is as clear as daylight that you are robbed by walkden and scudamore conjointly but i really do not think that you could prove a conspiracy in a criminal court i should however decidedly advise you to resist the payment of the bills and as walkden is tolerably sure to push the matter on to trial the verdict of a jury in the civil case will enable us to judge how far we may hope to punish the scoundrel attorney in another manner alexander had accordingly placed himself entirely in his solicitor's hands and there rested the business for the present but a serious change took place in the disposition and habits of alexander craddock smarting under the wrongs which he had received he grew restless and unsettled experienced less delight than he was wont to feel in the society of his wife and children showed signs of irritability and an impatience of the slightest contradiction however trivial and remained longer over his wine after dinner lucy beheld all this and wept in secret but when with alexander she redoubled her attentions and sought every possible opportunity of proving her devotion she implored him to give up the house they then occupied and adopt a more economical mode of life but his answers were at first evasive then impatient and at last so sharp and angry that she was compelled though with reluctance to abandon the topic at least for the present to add to lucy's grief her aunt who had so long fulfilled towards her the duties of a mother was attacked with sudden indisposition which increased with alarming rapidity and carried her off in the course of a few days alexander manifested far less sorrow than lucy had expected him to have shown and this proof of an augmenting callousness on his part pierced the heart of the amiable young lady to the very quick but scarcely had the remains of miss middleton been consigned to the tomb when a fresh misfortune occurred to increase the irritability of alexander the bills for eight thousand pounds fell due and were dishonoured by him in accordance with the advice of his solicitor he was immediately after arrested and as he had resolved to defend the action he paid into court the whole sum in dispute a proceeding whereby he could alone save himself from remaining in prison until the trial he had however gone through the ordeal of a sponging house and he considered himself disgraced the irritability of his temper increased he daily grew more attached to the bottle and his affections towards his wife and children were evidently blunted oh how ramified and vast are the evil effects 
of the villainy of one man towards another striking not only the individual victim but rebounding and reacting on his wife his children and his friends lucy again revived the expression of her wish that a cheaper dwelling should be taken and a more economical style of living adopted but alexander would not listen to the proposal he declared his certainty of gaining the suit and of recovering his money from the court a result he said which would enable him to employ his funds in some legitimate commercial enterprise on this subject he spoke so confidently that lucy entertained the most sanguine hope of beholding happiness restored beneath a roof where naught save happiness had once prevailed and it was but with little apprehension that she marked the arrival of the day fixed for the trial the most able counsel had been retained on both sides and the cause excited immense interest walkden had been established for years and bore an excellent character indeed none of his friends or clients could for a moment believe that he was an accomplice of the villain scudamore the whole question as presented to the cognizance of the tribunal was whether miss walkden had given value for the bills and was a bona fide holder of securities which he had legitimately and honourably discounted in the course of business the evidence he adduced to establish these points was certainly of a nature likely to prove most convincing to a jury though alexander knew full well that walkden had suborned the grossest perjury on the part of his clerks and the other persons whom he put forward as witnesses nevertheless the verdict was in walkden's favour and alexander returned home a prey to the liveliest grief and the most bitter resentment lucy did all that woman's goodness and ingenuity could suggest to console him but the excitement of his feelings gained upon him with such overwhelming violence and rapidity that he grew delirious and a brain fever supervened the best medical advice was procured for him by the almost heartbroken lucy but weeks and weeks passed away without enabling the physicians to pronounce him beyond the reach of danger during that period he had many lucid intervals on which occasions he recognized his wife and children embraced them tenderly wept over them implored heaven to bless them and then in the bitterness of overwhelming reminiscences desired them to look upon him as one who was dead his excitement relapsing into delirium again poor lucy seldom was it that she reposed her aching head upon a pillow throughout the period of her beloved husband's illness and never until completely crushed with the fatigue of long vigils and the burthen of a grief beneath which she herself was sinking at length just as her pecuniary resources began to fail and the want of funds excited alarms which augmented her afflictions alexander's malady took a sudden turn and filled her mind with the most joyous hope and when the delirium had altogether passed away his manner was so kind and gentle his language so endearing and affectionate and his temper so entirely devoid of irritability that lucy's heart became elate with the most cheering aspirations and delightful visions alexander spoke of his misfortunes with calmness and resignation and said our property is all swept away dearest but i am young and shall soon be strong and active again and then i will work to obtain a livelihood for us all and who knows my beloved lucy but that the bread of honest though perhaps severe toil may not prove the sweetest we shall have ever eaten then when his wife heard him discourse in this manner she would throw herself into his arms and thank him yes thank him fervently for becoming a consoler in his turn the fond pair had been conversing in this style one afternoon the first day on which alexander was enabled to walk downstairs to the parlour without assistance and their children were playing in a corner of the apartment when the door was suddenly 
and violently opened and two or three coarse-looking fellows unceremoniously made their appearance their mission was soon explained the money paid into court had only just covered the amount of the bills of exchange which had formed the ground of action and alexander was now arrested by walkden for the costs which had been taxed at a hundred and odd pounds the unfortunate young couple had not the money and lucy had already made away with their plate jewellery and other valuables in order to provide her husband with every comfort and luxury in his illness the furniture was worth more than the amount of the costs but arrears of rent were due to the landlord lucy implored the bailiffs with tears in her eyes not to remove alexander for a few days when he might have recovered the shock of this new and unforeseen blow but they were inexorable intimating pretty plainly that they were instructed to show no leniency of any kind she however by dint of entreaties actually going down on her knees to the officers succeeded in inducing them to wait until she repaired to his own solicitor but this gentleman was unable to assist her to the amount she required he nevertheless manifested the kindest and most respectful sympathy towards her giving her a few guineas for immediate necessities and promising to incur the expense of the measures necessary to enable her husband to remove next day from a lock-up house to the king's bench it was some consolation to the almost heart-broken young lady to find that alexander possessed at least one friend in the world but even this faint and poor gleam of solace vanished and gave way to the keenest apprehensions when on her return she found her husband a prey to all that fearful excitement which had proved the forerunner of his late dangerous malady what was to be done there seemed but one alternative and this she was determined in her affectionate solicitude and zeal to adopt without the knowledge of alexander indeed he scarcely appeared to be aware of what was going on but raved talked wildly and menaced and wept by turns in the presence of the officers who surrounded him away sped lucy to bush lane and a second time did she enter the establishment of that individual who had brought such rapid such signal such unredeemable ruin on the heads of a once happy family walkden received her in his private office and coldly desired her to be seated a smile of infernal triumph relaxing his stern and usually rigid features while his eyes scanned the wasted but still touchingly beautiful and deeply interesting countenance of that afflicted young lady lucy was for some minutes so overcome by the intensity of her feelings that she was unable to utter a word and when she did speak it was a mere gasping forth of disjointed sentences broken by frequent sobs of convulsing agony the lawyer bent over her like satan whispering to a desperate creature the terms on which wealth and power might be purchased bent over that crushed much enduring and amiable young wife and murmured in her ears his terms of mercy towards her husband she rose and looked at him in amazement and horror was he a human being or a veritable fiend his cold gray eyes sank not beneath the reproachful and indignant glance of that outraged lady and a smile of demoniac triumph again played upon his lip doubtless he thought that her anger was only momentary and that the sternness of necessity would force her to a compliance with his will but he knew not the mind of lucy villain monster she exclaimed has your infamy no bounds and she fled from the presence of the cold-blooded scoundrel as if the atmosphere which he breathed were fraught with the plague with what a heavy heart did she return home that home from which her husband must now be dragged immediately and before her eyes a home which perhaps would not long remain so for herself and children but suddenly 
as if by divine inspiration she remembered that all her courage was now required to enable her to bear up against her afflictions for the sake of alexander for the sake of her offspring and it is astonishing how in the midst of the deepest sorrows woman can oft-times display an energy of which the stronger sex is altogether incapable and so it now was with lucy craddock she even succeeded in comforting her husband and soothing his excitement by reminding him that the more he appeared to be crushed the greater would be the delight of his savage and unrelenting enemy this species of remonstrance so kindly so gently administered had the desired effect and alexander animated with a spirit of endurance and fortified by the example of his admirable wife rose if possible superior to his misfortunes and proceeded with a feeling of proud resignation to the lock-up house thence on the ensuing day he was removed to the king's bench and it was here that i first formed his acquaintance when he entered the prison six years ago immediately after his arrival his spirits gave way rapidly and it was necessary for his wife to take up her abode with him altogether she accordingly disposed of the furniture in their house paid the landlord and the few other small creditors and brought her children over to the small cheerless chamber in which her husband was lying on a bed of sickness thus was this once happy family like so many many others reduced from a state of comfort and even affluence to poverty and a prison-room heaven only knows what misery what privations they had undergone when it was first whispered to me by a charwoman that the craddocks seemed to be in great distress i was then a little better off than i am now and i immediately repaired to their room inventing some excuse for my intrusion oh what a scene of destitution what a heart-rending spectacle met my eyes the furniture which the craddocks had hired had been all removed away in consequence of their inability to pay for its use alexander pale and emaciated was sitting upon a trunk the two children thin and wasted were crying for food and the poor heart-rent lucy was looking over a few things in a hat-box evidently with a view to select the most likely articles to be received by the pawnbroker while her scalding tears fell fast upon her hands as she turned over the only relics left of a wardrobe once extensive and elegant it went to my very soul to contemplate that scene i shall not pause to explain all the particulars which rendered me intimate with the craddocks suffice it to say that they accepted my assistance and that in a few hours their chamber once again wore an aspect of such comfort as the restitution of the furniture and a well-supplied table could possibly afford in a prison i did not learn their history immediately nor all its details at once portions of it were communicated by degrees some of the particulars oozed out incidentally and the feelings and sentiments experienced by the sufferers in the various phases of their eventful tale transpired from time to time until at length i gleaned all those facts which i have now related to you but by far the most terrible portion of the history of the craddocks is yet to come prout paused for a few moments and then inquired of frank curtis if he were wearied of the narrative the young gentleman assured him that so far from being tired of the story he was deeply interested in its progress whereupon the chancery prisoner proceeded in the following manner o oh, woman in our hours of ease uncertain coy and hard to please and variable as the shade by the light quivering aspen made when pain and anguish wring the brow a ministering angel thou walter scott and such is woman's love the secret power that turns the darkest to the brightest hour that smooths the wrinkles care has learned to plough and wipes the trace of anguish from the brow 
and oh if spite of war and wasting pain feelings so noble so divine remain where were the brighter star to cheer our gloom make heaven of earth and triumph o'er the tomb university prize poem end of section one hundred fourteen section one hundred and fifteen of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter one hundred eight conclusion of the tale of sorrow although i was enabled to administer temporary assistance to this unfortunate and persecuted family and under the delicate guise of a loan of money gave them the wherewith to make themselves comparatively comfortable it was nevertheless necessary for alexander to resolve upon some decisive step to remain in prison was to bury his talents in a manner so as to render them completely unavailable to think of liquidating the enormous burthen of debt which lay upon his shoulders was ridiculous and to move the stony heart of walkden was a hopeless idea the only alternative was the insolvents court good food medical attendance and the altered appearance of his wife and children who had all improved greatly restored alexander to some degree of health and spirits and he soon began to discuss with me and lucy his present position and plans for the future the lawyer who had enabled him to pass over to the bench returned to town at this precise period after some weeks absence and he not only agreed to provide the funds to take alexander through the insolvents court but also promised to give him employment as a clerk on his release thus was it that this good man infused hope into the bosoms of the craddocks and the necessary steps were adopted to effect the emancipation of the prisoner but scarcely were the initiatory proceedings set on foot when intelligence was received to the effect that walkden was resolved to oppose alexander's discharge by all the means that were within his power this intimation which reached the prison through a private channel aroused alexander's fury against the man who so unrelentingly persecuted him and it required all the attentions of his amiable wife and all the manifestations of friendship which i was enabled to offer to restore him to comparative tranquillity well the day fixed for his examination at the insolvents court arrived and alexander proceeded thither in the usual charge of a tipstaff his case was called on at an early stage of the day's business and he found a formidable array of counsel employed against him i shall not pause to dwell upon all the details of the proceeding suffice it to say that walkden was placed in the witness-box and being examined by the barristers whom he had feed made the entire case look so fearfully black against alexander craddock that he was remanded to jail for twelve months his discharge to take place at the expiration of that period fearful was the state of excitement in which he returned to the bench and in the course of a few hours he was delirious it was frightful to hear his ravings in which the name of walkden was uppermost and associated with the bitterest imprecations and menaces poor lucy i thought her heart would break as she sat watching by her husband's bed but she was rewarded to some extent for her vigils and her sorrow when on the return of his senses he recognized her before he even knew his own children much less me his humble friend and manifested his purest love for her 
in the most impassioned language and with the tenderest embraces but though the delirium left him and returned no more he soon fell into a deep and brooding melancholy from which it was scarcely possible to arouse him he fancied himself dishonoured permanently dishonoured by the sentence passed upon him by the insolvents court and though the friendly lawyer and myself as well as lucy endeavoured to reason with him against the belief pointing out every circumstance calculated to prove that he was a victim and not a culprit he took the matter so to heart that it was evident his spirit was broken my own resources began to fall off at this period and i was unable to assist the craddocks as much as i could wish moreover alexander and lucy both felt averse to remain dependent upon me and the friendly lawyer had proved so generous that they were naturally delicate in applying to him lucy accordingly made up her mind how to act she proposed that they should move over to the poor side and receive the county money they would thus obtain a room rent free and a few shillings a week to purchase bread alexander's pride struggled against this project but he yielded at last to the entreaties and representations of his excellent wife who assured him that she felt no shame in showing that she was poor and that the only real disgrace lay in dishonesty wherefore then should we contract any debts which we cannot pay she inquired and if we continue to live in this part of the prison we must keep up certain appearances which we have not the means to do alexander succumbed i say to this reasoning and to the poor side they accordingly removed i never shall forget the day when this change took place lucy had made the new chamber look as neat as possible and she endeavoured to maintain a smiling exterior as she arranged the little furniture and the few things of their own which were left to them but every now and then she glanced anxiously towards her husband who sat in a musing or rather an apathetic manner watching her proceedings and i observed that a tear frequently started to her eye and that every now and then she caught up her children and pressed them passionately to her bosom i insisted upon providing dinner on that day and i did all i could not only to make this poor family as comfortable as possible but also to raise alexander's spirits but if he smiled it was so faintly or sickly that my heart sank within me as if he had been my own son a few weeks passed away and i observed that lucy managed to keep the family pretty comfortably they had no lack of plain and humble food and the children were always neat and clean whenever i called at their room i found lucy busy in some way or another either washing or mending the clothes or ironing out her husband's linen or else plying the needle at work which though i know little of such matters did not seem to me to have any reference to the family wardrobe at all one night i could not sleep and got up to take a walk round the prison it was between twelve and one and as i passed round by the poor side i chanced to look up at the window of the craddock's room to my surprise i observed a light burning and the truth flashed upon me poor lucy was sitting up to work to waste her youth her health and her spirits over the needle that she might obtain the means to purchase comforts for her husband and children the conviction went to my very heart like a pang and i thought how bitter is often the mission of a good and virtuous woman in this world i remember that i had no inclination to retire to rest again that night and i kept walking walking round the prison impelled by some invincible influence thus to wander about the gloomy place as if to watch how long the feeble light would be burning in that one room it was nearly four o'clock when that light was extinguished and i heaved a sigh as i murmured to myself the name of poor lucy craddock when day came and i was enabled to call upon alexander after breakfast 
i examined the young wife and mother with more attention than usual and it then struck me that she was visibly wasting away her health was evidently declining and her spirits were entirely forced she was gay and lively as ever but that gaiety and liveliness were assumed not real artificial not natural the veil which an excellent and amiable woman a most affectionate wife and the best of mothers put on to cover the secret of her breaking heart three months